Hello, great and bountiful YouTube empire. I'm your host, Gene Ferno, and it's been a while since I recorded myself making some art. I'm still chugging away at part three of every black character in Star Wars, actually co-editing it at the same time as this video. But this one's a bit easier to get done quickly, so it's probably what you're going to see first. Since it's been a while and things have changed a little bit, I figured I'd take some time here to review some of my process when it comes to art, as well as share some of the ways my art style has evolved since the last video I made on this topic. First of all, you may have noticed that there was already a rough sketch before I even started. I typically draw the sketch first, and to be honest, I'm not sure I've ever done a rough sketch on screen for you guys. I've got a lot in my backlog, so I'm not sure when that'll change, but I'll have to remember to do that sometime so you guys can see it happen. As far as this sketch goes, it's actually been on my backlog for quite some time. I scribbled this concept up all the way back in April of 2020. In fact, I'm pretty sure it may have made a brief appearance in the previous video I made with Sam and Puck celebratory drink. One well, of these days I'll draw these two outside of a coffee shop slash coffee shop adjacent setting, but well, as you can see, not yet. Anyway, I've said my piece so far, so let's speed things up a little while I clean up the sketch and forge it into some proper line art. So, first things first, organization is important. I tend to wobble between being hyper-vigilant in my organization and not even bothering to set up proper folders. I have, however, developed a method I feel does well to match my non-destructive multi-layered line art style and my general disinterest in naming every single one of my layers. For each individual character, I set up a folder for shading, line art, and color, and if need be, extras and special effects. For now, since I'm only working on the line art, that's the folder you're going to see in my layers section. My line art folder typically gets subdivided into two sections, the clothes and the form. The clothing folder typically stays unified, though on rare occasions I may specify tops and bottoms, but the form is often made up of two other subdivisions, being a folder for the head and the body. For me, that tends to keep things nice and clean for the most part, and it's easier for me to figure out where I'm working from. I may on occasion add a separate folder for hair if a character's hair is particularly complex or the head needs to be masked for the hair to work but that wasn't necessary this time around, at least not for Sam, who I'm working on drawing now. All right, here's my next talking point. You may have noticed I'm struggling a bit with the arms here, or rather, not so much the arms, but the hands. Hands are hard, and sometimes they work, sometimes they're just the bane of everything. So this time around, I decided to help myself a little, and I took some reference photos of myself so I could get the hands drawn accurately. When in doubt, references are a godsend, especially when it comes to little details that get tricky for everyone, like hands. I don't use this method for drawing hands all the time, but when I just can't seem to get it right or anywhere close, this usually helps out in a pinch. Now that the hand issue is resolved, I'm going to move on with the rest of the body. While I work on this, I may as well reintroduce you to some of the characters as we go along. Sam and Puck have been featured in some of my previous works, and I've shared art of them through my community tab where I've been posting artwork weekly. But there's always room for a refresher. Or a brand new explanation, if you happen to be one of my new reviewers. The character I'm lining now is Sam. He, alongside the other focus character in this piece, Puck, are a pair of my superhero OCs native to Minneapolis. When he's not at school or investigating the mysterious lab explosion that gave him his powers, Sam protects the people of Minneapolis as a hero known as Kinetic. As his name would imply, he has telekinetic abilities, as well as a few junk powers, like the ability to perfectly mimic the sound of a rubber duck, and the ability to inexplicably produce rainbows at will. Puck, real name Eddie Duarte, is Sam's closest friend. After having been rescued by Kinetic, it didn't take long for Puck to suss out the hero's secret identity. This was mostly due to his super intelligence rather than a lack of care on Sam's part. For a time, Puck would work as Sam's guy in the chair before eventually donning a suit of his own and joining him in the field under the alias Puck. As for probably one of my worst kept secrets, 
and something I've very clearly spoiled in previous artwork, and even in this very image, Puck has a massive crush on Sam, and they eventually become romantically involved. Here I'm using some basic shapes to make the coffee mug. Literally just threw together a bunch of circles and a round edge square and masked out all the parts of that intersect. Masks, by the way, are a non-destructive way of hiding or erasing things you don't want visible. As you can see, those extra lines are gone. However, if I were to delete or hide the mask I put over it, they would reappear because they weren't technically erased, just hidden. And again, with the table, I just threw some basic shapes up. Mostly circles again to approximate something that looked good enough. Here you see me messing around with the size of the canvas a bit. The scope of this image changed a couple of times. Initially, as the sketch suggested, it was supposed to just be Sam and Puck, but I'd been thinking about including some of my other hero characters in the background, and I wanted to make sure that the image had more of a standard 1920 by 1080 aspect ratio, mostly because I wanted to make sure it actually fit when I uploaded it to Instagram. Eventually, I decided against adding all the characters I was thinking of, feeling it would make things a bit overcrowded and distract from the focal point of the piece. But you'll see in a bit, I did end up adding a couple more characters. Ah uh, yes, here I'm adding in a countertop for ordering coffee in this coffee shop. I would already thrown together a rough outline for it before I decided to film the piece, but here I'm trying to build it out proper. This counter, in my opinion, was one of the tougher aspects of this piece. My idea for it was both a little too specific and yet also not clear enough, so it ended up getting trapped in a sort of strange hexagonal no man's land. But I forged through and eventually came out with something that was at least passable if not perfect. Fortunately, I didn't need a whole lot for this picture, but it's something I'll have to better consider ahead of time for the next one that takes place in this location. And the rest is just filling out some small details in the background, which in this case is just kind of the front door of the coffee shop and some windows. Normally at this point I'd be moving on to the coloring phase, and indeed you can see as I begin to mask out each character and fill their shapes with a basic white color that I'm beginning that process. To do this I'm essentially just selecting the outside of the entire character with the magic wand tool making sure to nab any holes as well so there aren't any that get colored in when they should be invisible. And with everything selected I then expand my selection by two pixels. It's a small touch, but it's been the single biggest time saver in my artwork. If you've seen my previous videos, you may have seen a particular step where I would have to go around the perimeter of each character and erase a very thin white outline of about 1-2 to two pixels deep due to the overflow from using the paint bucket tool. Expanding my selection by 2 pixels completely eliminates the need for that step, as it causes my selection to be within the confines of the line art I made, rather than just shy of the exterior, which means there are no little artifacts to clean up whatsoever, typically. The amount the selection should be expanded on may vary based on your line weight, I tend to use 5 to 10 pixel lines on the 72 dpi canvas, so in my case, expanding by 2 pixels works perfectly. After that, I invert my selection so it has everything inside that range selected rather than everything around the range, and I fill it with the base white color that will eventually get changed later. But having the characters filled with anything sooner rather than later helps a lot with visibility. It also helps with knowing what layers need to be rearranged or masked when things overlap, like with this table here that Sam's arm is resting on. Since the table is in a layer folder above Sam, I had to mask out where Sam's arm covers the table, and then make sure I wasn't masking out where the table covers Sam. Then I did roughly the same thing for the rest, and I made the floor purple for visibility. So up to this point I had settled on the image just featuring Sam and Puck, however as I got finished with the background I realized it felt strangely empty, like Sam and Puck were being all flirty at this eerie cafe where Puck was the only employee and there were no other guests. Now I did consider adding some more patrons or a table or something, but ultimately I didn't feel like there was a lot of room with how I designed the background. But I did at least manage to squeeze in a couple more characters. 
first something of a personal favorite who I really got to draw more of, Cade. Although he's a dog, he's actually Sam's older brother. Due to the incident that gave Sam his powers, Cade's mind and body fused with the lab's therapy dog and now he's trapped in the dog's body. He can talk and otherwise retains his human intelligence and consciousness. Oh man, I was wondering what I'd lost. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but while I was working on this, I realized my recording software had stopped recording my footage. I thought I'd only lost a bit of the work I did on Cade, but reviewing the footage now, I realize I completely lost my footage of the line art for the other barista back there. So just real quick, I'll give the rundown. Her name is Mikkel, and along with Puck, she works at Reindeer Coffee. She's a classmate of Sam and Puck, and is friendly with the pair. She often finds herself getting into trouble when she goes a bit too far investigating some of the villains and other dangerous happenings in the city, so Kinetic has had to bail her out of more than once. I haven't had the time to develop her character too much outside of the base concept, and this is actually the first time I've ever officially put a design of her to Paige, but I thought it might be nice because I've been wanting to include some of Sam and Puck's other friends for a while now, especially some of the non-super ones, so it's nice to find an excuse to do that. Finally, on to the coloring phase. I try to keep my colors consistent across my various works, so when I can, I tend to pull in some of my flat reference images so I can rip the colors from them directly. Flat, of course, referring to artwork without any shading or rendering. Flat colors, a bit similar to a picture or image with flat lighting. So now that I've got my color refs pulled in, I'm going to start by... Well, I'm briefly going to do Puck's skin tone first. My plan was to do him second, as given the angle, there was a particular modification I'd have to make on his work apron that I wanted to jump into another program for, but in the moment I forgot and I started trying to work on him before remembering my plan and getting started on Sam as intended. When it comes to coloring, I typically start out by adding a new folder labeled color beneath my line art folder, as you saw earlier when I added the white fills on Sam and Puck. I then select the outline of the figure, expand my two pixels, and fill with white, which I'll later change using a layer style color change to match the character's base skin tone. With the selection still active, I'll then mask the entire color folder so that regardless of how I color it, the colors won't bleed beyond the line art. Maybe you already noticed it, but it was around this point I became acutely aware that Sam was just inexplicably floating in the air. As it turned out, I'd completely forgotten to draw a chair for him. So I made a quick note to myself for after I was through working on Puck, so I wouldn't forget. Spoilers, but I would proceed to forget it for a while. about it. I'm pretty sure I used the wrong color here. I guess it's fine and technically it still works, but that darker corner in there was meant to be a tiny bit of Puck's super suit peeking out from under its clothes. Here I used the dark part of his suit from the coffee shop kiss piece, but based on the location of the peak, it probably should have been the brighter blue above the belt in that piece. I suppose it works either way, but the blue would have been slightly more accurate. As I'm working on the dots on these shoes, I feel now is a good time for a quick lesson on layers and layer management. You may notice that sometimes I tend to put different colors on different layers. This is all due to preference, and I've been doing that a lot less as time goes on. But if you want a truly non-destructive workflow when it comes to coloring, this is not a bad method to use. And what's about to happen here with the shoe is a great example of why, and how I could have saved myself a lot of time. So now as all the circles are manually colored in, you can see my next thought process was simply to select the rest of the piece, expand by, I think I only did one pixel this time, and fill it with the necessary color. But then I ran into a problem. Because I was on the same layer as the dots I'd just made, it created this nasty artifact issue where some of the pixels didn't fill, mostly due to the anti-aliasing probably. But if the anti-aliasing had been off, it would have looked really jagged regardless. Anyway, so I then figured that I could just fill in the 
unfilled areas manually, which technically would work, except the work area here is so small that even my one pixel expansion of the selection caused enough bleeding over the lines to make this happen. So I was forced to once again go over each of the circles manually to fix it. Now that that's fixed, I'll show you a better way to do this with the dots on the upper section of the shoe. You'll notice that they're already colored in as well and are also on the very same layer. I'm going to repeat what I just did by selecting the space that needs to be colored in and expanding by one or two pixels. And just to demonstrate, staying on the same layer and doing exactly what I did prior results in much the same issue. So I'm going to get rid of that and instead, with the very same unaltered selection, I'm going to make a new layer beneath where the dots are colored and simply fill in the color on that layer. No further management required. This is a perfect example of why I utilize the pixel expansion and why I prefer to color on a separate layer below my line art. And furthermore, why I often have multiple color layers. It's important to be mindful of these things for efficiency's sake as you work on your own art. But be mindful either way. Even with my methods, things can get confusing or out of hand really fast, which is part of why I've started toning down the number of layers I use a bit. Now that I've gotten the base colors for Puck finished, there was a very special element I wanted to include and make an official asset for. I'm going to switch over from Photoshop to Illustrator for this one. Excuse the weird cropping, since I was mostly using my mouse rather than my tablet for this, I went ahead and filmed it on my ultra wide screen. And I'm going to make an official Reindeer Coffee logo based on the one I roughly threw together for the celebratory drink pick. I typically reserve using Illustrator for more simple projects like patterns, logos, and making cleaned up, finalized weapon designs based on rough sketches I did in Photoshop. That's mostly because as a vector based program, while one might argue Illustrator is cleaner and more versatile, it's a lot more rigid than something raster based like Photoshop. I think there are probably some ways I could get a workflow in Illustrator that's similar to my work in Photoshop. I've actually got a close friend who makes phenomenal works exclusively in Illustrator. And I've watched him draw and I still don't know how he does it. But personally, I haven't messed around with Illustrator enough to feel comfortable with doing my, all my work in there. Fortunately, this logo is pretty simple. And I'll more or less just be tweaking some basic shapes again until I've got something I'm happy with. Then it's time for the war of the fonts. This often takes the longest when it comes to making logos. Choosing the right font can really make or break a logo. For this, I wanted something that felt similar to the vague rough font I'd hand drew in the past, but it also had to match and go well with the new cleaned up logo as well. After a lot of trial and error, I realized I forgot to put a harness on the reindeer. And then I finally whittled things down to the final font, exported it and brought it into the new image. It should be fairly obvious based on the line art, but initially I was planning to keep the apron more or less identical to the one Puck wore in the coffee shop kiss piece. However, with the advent of the reindeer coffee logo, I got pretty excited and wanted the pre-existing pattern I'd made and used in the celebratory drink picture to be represented on the apron as well. So I made the necessary modifications. The steam was a bit of a challenge. I don't yet have a ton of experience playing around with those kinds of textures yet, but it's always a good idea to dig through your library of brushes to see what you have to play with. Sometimes the things you can find may surprise you. After some trial and error on my end, I wound up finding a brush designed specifically for smoke trail, so using it to depict steam was simple. Finally, time to color Mikkel. I don't typically show the mood boards I use for my character designs, mostly because being a mood board, by nature they often feature images of people or artwork that I didn't make, take, or own, and as such I've never felt particularly comfortable just having them on display. When filming my work, I often try to keep the visibility of their usage limited so I can cut out those shots when need be. This time, however, since I was working with a new character that didn't have any pre-existing color scheme or concept art to pull from, I'd need to rely on having my mood board out more than usual. So I found my solution by simply blurring the mood board so the finer details wouldn't be visible. All that really matters for this section is the colors anyway, and I found that pixelating, or in Photoshop terms, pixel mosaicing, an image can also be very beneficial for pulling out more general colors that are a lot less nuanced than trying to say find a specific shade of brown in, on a photo of a human's face. Additionally, I wanted to briefly give a shout out to mood boards and note that they are one of the quintessential tools of an artist. 
I've also heard them refer to as reference boards, but either way, it's the same thing. You gather up images that catch the vibe or inspire what you're trying to design or create, grab it into a picture or folder, etc., so that you can refer to it more easily as you work. It's basically the concept behind Pinterest. In fact, I have a lot of my references on Pinterest as well. I tend to fluctuate on and off with using Pinterest frequently, but it's certainly been helpful. When I realized I was going to have to design Mikkel for this piece, I actually went and gathered up the refs on my Pinterest board for her and made my mood board out of them. All right, now that I'm working on the background, things are getting a little wild. What you're seeing here are screenshots I took in Unreal Engine of a different cafe I modeled out for a different project. I haven't had the time to make a model for the Reindeer Cafe or anything yet, so I'm going to be pulling some elements from this to get the final elements I need to get the place feeling a little more like a cafe. I won't be taking much this time around, I've really just the food display and the cash register. You may also recognize that this is the same cafe I used in the coffee shop Kiss piece. Mostly I used it there as a placeholder as I didn't really have any concept of Reindeer Coffee at the time. And now as I'm developing the world a little more, I wanted to make Reindeer Coffee a little more unique rather than reusing an asset for a cafe that literally exists on a different planet. So these elements don't stand out so awkward, I'm going to redraw them with my own lines to help them blend in better, and so I can redesign them a bit to suit the new location. Well, I'm not really changing the cash register all that much, but the food display got significantly altered. The biggest challenge was getting the angle of the food display to feel right. I almost bit off a little more than I could chew here with wanting it to be built into the hexagonal counter. I think I'll probably redesign this counter again the next time I draw this space and I almost gave up on including the food display entirely, but in the end I managed to get something that worked well enough. It ends up being covered up by Puck anyway. And again I'm pulling out some colors from some reference images that I had of a particular coffee shop from Minnesota that Reindeer Coffee happened to be inspired by to get some of the colors for the background and using some gradients to get a shiny gleam on the windows. In retrospect, I should have made the windows a little more blue tinted. You'll understand why in a bit when I get to shading. Taking a quick review of the piece so far, something feels off. Did you see it? That's right, I forgot the chair. So this is where I finally remembered to add that in. It certainly felt weird drawing in an entirely new element from scratch this late in a piece. I don't have much to say about this. It's not really a great practice, but food is tricky and I was running out of steam for something that's so complex at this point. As time goes on and my art style improves, I try to shy away from composting more and more, but, but it can still be useful in a pinch. Anyway, this one ended up serving its purpose. I may have to do a dedicated video on how to draw food properly at some point. Not quite onto shading yet. But I felt at this stage the floor looked unnaturally plain. The reference I used to help inspire the design of the coffee shop had wood flooring, but I hadn't really set up the floor here to resemble wood in any way. So in lieu of a texture, it just appears as a strangely smooth, ambiguous surface. I wanted to make it feel a bit more floor-like, so I decided to dig into my array of brushes again and, and find some things that could scuff up and give some texture to the floor so it at least looked more lived in. I don't mess around with textures like this super often, at least I haven't yet but I just experimented and messed around with it until I got something I felt looked good. It's a pretty standard and generic floor, so there wasn't a lot of pressure for anything specific. The most I wanted to do was make sure it didn't look too dirty or too dingy, just enough to look like a floor people use and not some rundown, falling apart place. And finally, we've made it to shading. I think from my previous art videos, this is where the more major differences in my art style are. Though, it's not so much that my style has changed a lot as I've shifted more towards a cell shading-esque style versus the more soft shading style from my previous videos. It's a matter of personal preference, I think both work great, and if a piece demands it, I'm more than willing to go back to doing the soft shading techniques again. Mostly I just find my cell shading techniques to be a bit lower maintenance while still looking just as good. And the margin of error is lower as well. So when it comes to shading, I start out much in the same way I start coloring. I add a new folder for the shading layers, select the outline with my figure, 
Fill it with my faint shading blue color and then mask the whole folders so the colors don't seep out beyond the lines. I set my blue shading layer style to multiply, which makes the layer into a sort of transparent but darkening color. And then I open up the layer style options, which unfortunately do the way I film this, you won't be able to see, which is why sometimes things just sort of happen when there should be pop-ups and other things. And I'll mess around with the gradients and color overlays until I feel the color and shading matches the mood of the scene. Once I've settled on the color scheme, I can begin erasing chunks of light from the shadows. I think I've mentioned this in other videos, but back in the day I used to do what I've been referring to as additive shading, where essentially I was adding shadows on top of the piece where I thought they belonged. This had the effect of causing my shading to take a considerable amount of time, and it wouldn't always feel realistic. And overall, it was just a tedious and inconvenient way to handle things. Eventually, Following a suggestion from a friend, I tried testing out subtractive shading, where I would do what I'm doing here, covering the whole subject in shadow and removing the parts touched by the light. I suppose it's another preference thing, but for me, this method was significantly faster, easier to manage, and looks better, and is a bit more fun in general. There are multiple levels of shading I sometimes do. Typically, when I'm focused on cell shading, I'll stick to one level, either it's shaded or it isn't. But in certain situations, like here, where there are many elements that are in, in partial shade, I'll bump it up to two levels. To do this, I have my magic eraser tool set to 50% opacity, so when I have something selected and erase it with the backspace key, it gets totally erased. But when I instead switch to the magic eraser tool and use it, it'll only erase up to 50% opacity of the selection, and I can use it repeatedly if I want to make deeper levels of shadows. This is one of the ways cell shading is a bit faster for me than soft shading. As with soft shading, I'll typically have more than two levels of shading so I can get a nice gradation of shadows when I blur them together. Whereas with cell shading, I only ever need to deal with a maximum of two and save for very minor exceptions, like here on Puck's leg, I don't typically have to blend them together. Next is the lighting. This is pretty simple and remains more or less identical to my methodology with soft shading. I simply select out the areas that the light touches and needs more depth, and I fill them in with my soft yellow color. I typically use this yellow color. It's very rare that I don't, but like with all things, the color used is dependent on the location, theme, and mood of the, th of the image. Since this takes place inside a cafe that has yellow-hued overhead lighting, I stuck with yellow. After the fills are set, I go around and blur them so they aren't so overt and noticeable. Depending on how lazy I'm feeling, I might try to blend the whole layer at once, but typically I go in and make sure I select and blur each section specifically, as some areas may need to be blurred more or less than others. The blurs aren't universal, especially in areas like the face, which has smaller chunks of light. This is the other main reason soft shading takes longer, because I'd have to do this step for the shadows as well and basic lighting like this can be cheesed without too much issue. However, if the shadows look bad, it really brings down the whole piece. Shading can make or break an art piece. Rim lights are next. I sometimes refer to these as highlights, but given another step I do later on, for clarity's sake, I'm going to officially refer to this technique as a rim light, which is what it would be in photography, so it makes sense. In photography, a rim light is essentially a backlight which lights up the outline or, you know, rim of a character or subject for dramatic effect. This also helps create depth and highlights separation between figures and backgrounds, among other things. Back when I did some of my older videos, I was in some of the early stages of learning how to do a rim light effect in my art. I've made some improvements since then. So for this piece, I'm going to showcase the rim light in areas where the light would be striking the characters the most. And in this specific case, since I have two sources of light, the aforementioned golden overhead lights, and the light coming from the windows outside, I chose to use two colors for the rim lights. Again, the golden light from the overhead lights and an additional bright blue light coming from outside. This is also why earlier I said maybe I should have made the windows a bit more blue tinted as the blue I use for the rim light is a bit bright in hue compared to the light actually appearing through the windows. Regardless of that, I'm still happy with how it all turned out. 
I'm making sure to keep the rim light confined to the edges of the piece and making sure that there's a balance between it and the outlines of the character. I'm also going through and adding a mask and a gradient in the mask to get a sort of fading cutoff effect, very reminiscent of some of the key art for Sonic Adventure 2, just saying. Albeit without the drop shadows underneath the rim lights, but I digress. After that, I'll add in the fill lights. Again, this is something I've discussed in previous videos where I'm pretty sure I refer to it as ambient light, but basically light is not simple. Every object is constantly reflecting the light and colors of things surrounding it, even if the object isn't particularly reflective. So to get a similar effect and add more depth to the shading, I add in fill lights, essentially taking the colors that the area might be reflecting and adding them to the shadows as a highlight. I usually keep the light soft and depending on the situation or shininess of the object, bring the opacity down so it's suitable and maybe even just barely perceptible before blurring it. I'll be honest right here, I actually skipped a step. I'll get back to it later, but for now I'll follow the flow of the video and move on to ambient light. Nomenclature aside, this is actually a somewhat newer style of shading that I've added to my repertoire as part of my throw everything in the kitchen sink style of artistry. Basically though, in photography, ambient light is the light you're not bringing to the table. It's the pre-existing light in the space. When it comes to my art, it's the same sort of philosophy, though slightly different as since I'm creating this space, I'm naturally the one bringing in this light. But I basically treat it as almost a reversal of the fill light, an extension of the steps I skipped, which spoilers is the highlights. So basically, like I said before, light is reflecting from everywhere. When I add the highlights and fill lights, I'm choosing specific colors based on nearby surroundings to add these light reflections. But it's not always based on the only light affecting the section of that image. So the ambient light I use to just throw in whatever overall lighting situation may be missing. It's a bit like the general lighting, but more colorful and covering some of the broader strokes of the piece. Plus, I just think it makes things a little more fun. Though, in this specific piece, I did run into an issue of it kind of flattening the shading a bit and leaving things slightly washed out, but I managed to remedy that with adjustment layers later on. Also, the blush. Not much to say about it, it's a blush after all, but I wanted it to be a little bit subtle, but it brought some nice warmth to Puck's cheeks, which was especially nice since I didn't do any thermal shading for this piece, which I thought I explained in a previous video, but I, I may not have. Basically, with thermal shading, I'd shade a heat signature onto a character with reds and blues and oranges and yellows and, and then blur it and reduce the opacity so, so it was barely visible but left a human warmth up to the skin. You can check out Coffee Shop Kiss if you want to see what I'm talking about. I may have to make a video on the topic sometime. Anyway, I'll be quiet for a bit as I rinse and repeat with Sam. Alright, this is where I suddenly realized I forgot to do highlights on Puck. I'm going to finish them up on Sam first and then go back. But basically, highlights are pretty self-explanatory. They're similar to rim lights, except maybe not as harsh depending on how you handle them. Typically, they end up being a bit more distinctive for me. But because of the strength and amount of rim lights in this piece, they end up filling some of the same spaces and being a bit similar. Which is why I forgot about them in the first place. But highlights go anywhere where the lights are brightest. And now that's settled, gonna rinse and repeat for the rest of the piece. Oh yeah, another mistake I made. Ultimately didn't hurt the piece too much, but I realized afterward that I should have made the lights coming from the windows blue to match the blue rim light I put on everyone. I remedied this when I did the floor, but oh, whoops. 
In the final stretch now, all that's left are the mess around with the adjustment layers to make sure the saturation, vibrance, color correction, and contrast all, are all in order. And at the last minute, I decided to make a cute pink vignette and of course place the official logo. With that, the piece is finished. Here's how it turned out. This piece is titled Made With Love. Overall, it took about 10 hours, give or take. That's a rough estimate based on the footage I have, which is missing most of Mikhail's production. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is Chin Ferno signing off. <laughs>